A lot of people say I got her voice, because when they talk to me, they hear her voice on the phone. But um, I think I got her industriousness. My mom taught me how to walk. My mommy taught me how to dance. One thing she taught me how to do was how to not burn stuff in the oven when I'm baking, like cookies and all that stuff. Probably folding towels. So the one thing that I got from my mom is uh, her high cheekbones. They really show the most when she smiles. Yeah, definitely the cheekbones and maybe the nose. I don't know. <laughs> I did learn how to burp from my mom. Tim. One thing my mom passed down to me is her creativity. Probably how to share the gospel with others. Uh, we do devotions together. I recall just how often she would uh, encourage me in scripture. She had a relationship with Jesus and she talked that relationship. She is very selfless and humble in serving us. My mom had unwavering faith despite her uh, father and husband being persecuted in prison for gospel. My mommy prays with me every night. My mom teaches me that Jesus loves me. Thank you, Mom, for everything you've done for me. Even though sometimes I don't look like I appreciate it, I really do. Thank you for everything you've done for adopting me to your home. Thank you for uh, the example of strong faith that you have set. This is an experience that's really sweet. Yeah. Because the things he's telling you are the things my mother taught me. I love her. She's the best mom on earth. I got to tell her everything I wanted to tell her before she passed away. So I guess it's just Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mama. We love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. You are blessed. Man, was that good stuff or what? Man, that was just good to, to listen to all these reflections about your mom. And I kind of think that since they said, hey, this is what I learned from my mom, I got to tell you what I learned from my mom, what I took from her. And uh, one of the things, many things, I, I see my wife Jody's here, I'm so thankful for her. But if Jody was up on the stage right now, she would say, wouldn't it, isn't it true that my mom, I got my sense of humor from my mom. My mom's crazy. <laughs> she is, who's got a crazy mom? Just go ahead and let's say, uh, some of you, you won't do it because your mom's right next to you and you're just like, I, I don't want to rat her out. But, but my mom was absolutely nuts, okay? And so um, you can put your hand now, down now, son. <laughs> He's talking about his mom. And, um, but, but she would at the dinner table, okay, if you said, hey, 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 could you please pass a roll? I just would like a roll. Pass the roll. She would literally take that thing and cock the arm, and it was coming at you at full speed, 90-mile-an-hour fastball. I mean, she would curve it around people, and you're just like, whoa, what, what just happened? And just get, get hit in the head if you weren't paying attention. So I've adopted that philosophy. And if you say pass the roll in my house, I've had fun over the years with three daughters of hitting them literally with rolls and passing them. And I take great pleasure in now throwing them at the two son-in-laws. It's much more fun as they're bigger targets. But I learned a lot from my mom, and uh, I I'm so grateful to her. It's days like this where I think about my mom, and uh, she's been gone now. It's hard to believe uh, for 21 years. And so uh, I, I miss her. And I miss her because she showed the kind of love that I know many of your moms, they, they do. And it's, it's a bit relentless, if I could use that word to describe it, because um, it's through the thick and thin. It's through the good, bad, and the ugly. I mean, she was there like a mother's love can only be for her son. And uh, it reminds me of a poem that uh, maybe you've heard this. It's entitled A Mother's Love. It's by Helen Steiner Rice. And she writes, a mother's love is something that no one can explain. It is made of deep devotion and of sacrifice and pain. It is endless and unselfish and enduring come what may, for nothing can destroy it or take that love away. It is patient and forgiving when all others are forsaking and it never fails or falters even though the heart is breaking. It believes beyond believing when the world around condones and it glows with all the beauty of the rarest, brightest gems. It is far beyond defining. It defies all explanation. 
and it still remains a secret like the mysteries of creation. As many splendored miracle man cannot understand and another wondrous evidence of God's tender guiding hand. Let's give it up for the moms who are demonstrating that kind of relentless love. I'm so thankful for my wife, Jody. She's sitting here, and she showed that love to our three daughters. And again, I know many of you have too. But today, I, I want to just ask one question. And whether or not you feel like that you've received this kind of love or not, because if we got to be honest, some, you say, I'm reading that, you're like, I don't know, man. It, it just wasn't the way it was in my house. And if that's you, I, I understand what you're saying and what you're thinking and what you're feeling and what you're experiencing. But if we get beyond that for a moment, and I just want to ask this one question, how can we learn to love relentlessly with the people that are closest to us, with our family members especially? How can we love like that? That's what I want to talk to you about. So if you have a Bible, do this. Open it up to Genesis chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, no problem. There's one in a seat back nearest you, or you can follow along with the verses on the screen. We're going to move through 10 chapters of Scripture. We're going to cover 60 years. And I want to introduce you to a woman who many of you know already. She was a wife. She was a mom. And she didn't always get this love right. As a matter of fact, oftentimes, as we're going to see, she got it wrong. But she's still an example to us because if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we get it wrong. And oftentimes, we're struggling to get this right. And so I want to give you what I'm calling five lessons on loving relentlessly. Because I want to call all of us to a relentless love. That's what I'm asking of you. And that's what we want to model. Now, Catherine Ann Porter, she is a, um, a Pulitzer Prize winner, a journalist and writer, and she sa- she's got the most amazing quote. She says this of love. She says, love must be learned and learned and learned again and again. There's no end to it. End quote. Why does she say it like that? Because this isn't something that we get naturally. This is something that we need to learn. No matter what stage, no matter what age, no matter what relationship, no matter where we're at, inside the church and outside the church. Hey, if you're new with us today, we're in a series that's called DTR, and we've been talking about defining the relationship. And so we've been talking about all kinds of different relationships. Pastor Craig's in the front row here. Last week, he did an amazing job. Jody and I we were, uh, took a little vacation. It was actually a conference we were at, and um, took a little vacation and conference. And, and um, just to watch that message, Craig did an unbelievable job of helping us to understand what does it look like to define the relationship with the church in the time after all we've been through. So I want to commend you to listen to that message if you haven't already because it's uniting us as a church in where we want to go. Let's praise God for him and his leadership. So thankful to you, Craig. <laughs> Friendship that's, um, if some of you don't know, Pastor Craig, we go back 15, 20 years. So we've, we've known each other for, for a long, long time. But today, it's a DTR with family. Why? Let you in on a little secret. Family's oftentimes the hardest to love. I said it. Is it true? Don't hand, raise your hand. But isn't it true that oftentimes the people that are close to us are the ones we have the hardest time loving? So let me give you lesson number one. Five lessons, it's this. When I love relentlessly, that's the call to action. I'm going to sacrifice willingly. So there's some sacrifices that we do in the name of love. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 12. And again, I'm going to put the verses on the screen. I want to provide the backdrop for you of what's happening here. Um, We're going to look at a guy and a girl and some of you already whispered it, and you said, Sarah. And that's her. And, 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 and her name, though, is Sarai at first, and it's Abram. And their names get changed, but we'll get to that in a minute. But God did this in chapter 12. It's a monumental passage of scripture. This is the one to circle. This is the one that highlights. This is like God gave a promise to Abraham. And he said, you'll have as many descendants as the stars in the sky. You'll have as many descendants as the sand on the seashore. Think about that. That many spiritual descendants. That's what he's saying. And that's the vision that's painted. 
And that's why it says in Genesis chapter 12, verses one through three, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. There's the sacrifice. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's given them a vision. And oftentimes when we look at Genesis chapter 12, we think about the sacrifice that Abram made and we neglect the sacrifice that Sarai made. So we're not making that mistake today. What sacrifice did she make? Well, can you imagine, first off, the dealing with a husband that comes back out of his quiet time? Honey, call the realtor, we're moving. I mean, what? Okay, dear, where are we moving to? I don't know, I forgot to ask the Lord that. <laughs> don't you think that would have been a good thing to ask? I, I don't know if that's how it went down, but I mean, can you imagine that? God gave him this big vision and he was stepping out in faith and praise God for that, that they were willing to take the step of faith. And she loved relentlessly that she was willing to leave family. She was willing to leave friends. She left that corner coffee shop that she really liked. She even left that weekly Bible study with the girls. And she said, man, I'm going. And verse five, if you're careful attention, it says she went. So we know she went with him and because of her love for God and her love for her husband. I remember um, when my parents gathered us around the kitchen table in our home, and I was a little kid. I mean, I was in seventh grade, and I was moving into eighth grade. And, and they, my, my mom and dad just looked at us, and they said, we're moving. And, and so they moved, they were moving from Euclid, Ohio, which is northeastern Ohio, Euclid to Kirtland, which was pretty far. And, and I got to be honest, I, I wasn't real happy about it. I'm like, I, I don't want to leave my friends. I don't want to leave the basketball league. I, I don't, want to, I don't want to leave the school. I mean, I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a name here. I, like, I don't want to do it. And if I'm honest, I, I don't want Jody to hear this. The girl I had a crush on, she liked me. That's what I found out. And I'm like, I don't want to leave her. And so I'm like, you know, hey, I'm not moving. And so that's how many people feel when they move. And so my parents just looked at us and they're like, no, we are moving. And so they moved us all the way. Now, side story, moved us to Kirtland where I met my wife, Jody, and it was the best decision that ever been made, but I didn't see it then. Okay, now stop. That's part of the story I didn't mean to tell. But why did we move? It was because of my brother. And, and my brother, I, I just want to be gentle and um, responsible here. I mean, he was making some decisions that were not good decisions. He was hanging around with the wrong crowd. And um, he was on a track that if he continued on that track... Like, it, it, he's going down. This is, this is long-term effects. This is not going to be healthy. This is going to be bad. That's why my parents moved. They did it all for him. They were trying to break some relationships. Is, isn't it good for a parent? Is, I don't think I understood the magnitude of that until I had kids of myself. And the sacrifices that we're willing to make, amen, for our kids that, man, we got to move out of state. we got to do this. we got to do whatever you need to do. Love sacrifices. And when we love relentlessly, we're willing to make the sacrifices that are needed for the good of the whole family. For Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarah, as their names aren't changed yet, they were doing it for the good of the spiritual family, that, that they were going, man, and they were moving forward with little information, but by faith, trusting in him. Second lesson, if you're a note taker, go ahead and write this down. When I love relentlessly, I trust implicitly. So they were putting their stake in the ground. They're putting their trust in God, kind of. This is where the train went off the track. This is where we can all identify for a moment. Maybe not with what decision they made, but with some of the decisions we make that run contrary to what God wants. As they decided to take matters into their own hands, and they didn't trust in him implicitly. So take a look with me at chapter 16 for a moment. We'll put verse 2 up on the screen. And what happens next, it almost baffles the mind. But to give the backdrop, we need to understand, I didn't tell you this. Students of the Bible, maybe you saw it in your study notes already, you'll remember this from Sunday school that Abram and Sarah, Sarah 
was 65 years old when the promise was given. Abram was 75 years old. I mean, this is no spring chickens here. And God says, you know what? I'm going to give you a kid, and you're going to bless the world with that child. Well, that flip forward from chapter 12 to now chapter 16, verse 2, it's 10 years. And they're like, this hasn't happened yet. Like, so what's going on? So do the math. She's 75. He's 85. This is before in vitro and artificial insemination. I mean, this is what's going on. So now we can understand slightly when Sarah is like, I'm taking matters into my own hands. And Lord, if you're not going to get this done, I can get it done for you. Which is oftentimes where we go. When we do what? When we get ahead of God. Anybody with me? Oh, you don't want to be with me. But I know you've been there. Thank you for some honesty in the front row with the rest of these people. But we get ahead of God and... We try to solve things for ourselves, and, and I know I'm not the only tr- person in here that has trouble waiting on him, but that's what they did. And so now the setup for verse two, I mean, it comes out of nowhere. And Sarah said to Abram, behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that she, she, I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. What? You said, what? You can't have a baby, so go over to the neighbor's house? I mean, what are you talking about? That's the reaction that we have. But again, I think we'll do anything and everything to try to make things happen that we think are right, whether good or bad, and they oftentimes get us in trouble. When we get ahead of God, and for those that know the story, I mean... This is, that decision gave birth to a whole nation. And that nation is fighting with the other nation. Even to this day, our decisions have consequences when we get ahead of God. Give me a hand raise if you've ever gotten ahead of God. Come on now, let's be honest in our church. Thank you so much. Thanks for nobody in the balcony. Those are the spiritual people up there. (laughs) You're closer to heaven. You need to come down here. We need to send some more people up there. I believe me. Some of these, no. But let me give you five consequences of getting ahead of God because I don't want us to do it. And so first one is this. We're going to go through these quick. You step outside of what God wants to do for what you want to do. Hey, your motivations are probably right. Hey, the thing you want is probably a good thing. I want a kid. I want this. I want the family. But, but you're stepping outside of what he wants you to do in that particular time for what you want. You're not trusting in him. Second thing is this. You get ahead of God's timing and provision. So we're very guilty of this because we can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We can make things happen. We can get things going, even in the church, that, hey, we're getting ahead of God and whose kingdom are we building and let's go forward. And that, that what? That, that, that we get ahead of his provision and his timing. I, I, I just, you know, be honest with you. I, I, I mean, it's been 21 years since we started the church. And I got to tell you, I can remember back to some seasons and I just look at this crowd now and see where God has placed us and all these different locations and what all the Lord is doing. But can I just tell you that it wasn't always, like there was this couple seasons and they were years ago, but man, I was like, Lord, what are you doing? And, and, and I, 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 God gave me a vision, that it, like we're, we're, we got to get moving. And, and I've always prided myself, whether right or wrong, that, you know, God, if you open the door, man, I'm going to tell you something, Lord, you open the door, I will by faith trust in it. And if I fall flat on my face, it's okay if you don't catch me because I trust you that much. And, and I had a vision for what I believe the Lord gave us for the church. And man, we just weren't gaining traction. And so I met with a guy, he's a friend of mine, and he's a, a coach, uh, coaches all kinds of people, and um, he's actually got some counseling background, and, and I mean, um, he said to me, and I'll never forget this, he said, he said, Ron, he goes, the dream that God gave you for this church is bigger than the team you currently have to fulfill it. And he's, he, he just kind of gave me the illustration of pulling up on the reins, and trusting in God's timing. And I wish I could say, yeah, I did that. 
I, I didn't. And I kept pushing, and I put the pedal to metal, and we're going after that hill. And, and I got to just tell you, some of you have been around here a long time, and you know some of the things I'm talking about. Uh, you know what? There was relational pain. There was hurt. There, there, there was all kinds of difficulty that came as a result of getting ahead of God's timing. I had pain and emotional stress and as a result of getting ahead of God. So I hope as I bear my soul and be honest about where I've been, you can say to yourself, man, we do this. And, and these are the consequences. And the third one is this that, that I've learned is that, you know, I'm only writing, this is like from my journal. Are we seeing this? That, that you miss out on the lessons that God is trying to teach you. That's what you miss out on. And if you don't learn it then, he'll give you another opportunity where you mess up, hit bottom, and learn it then. That, that's what we see. So just another page out of the journal. You forfeit God's blessing. It is often delayed or denied. Like God's blessing, his desire to bless you can oftentimes not be realized if you get too far out ahead of him. And the last thing, you bring uncertainty and, and pain upon yourself, as I've described, and upon other people. And again, even if your motives are right, but type A personnel, I'm pressing forward, man, and are you with me? And I won't ask you to raise your hands again but I think we all get ahead of God. And I think we do it with decisions about life's most complicated issues, whether it's a job change, whether it's going back to school, whether it's even the decision, hey, should I have a family? Should I be married? Should I get a kid? Should I adopt it? What should we do? We gotta slow down and pull back the reins. And that's what Sarah and Sarai and Abram didn't do. We just interviewed a guy uh, on the podcast that I do recently. His name is John Mark Comer, and I highly recommend his book. It's called The Unhurried Life. And so we just, I just interviewed him. It'll come out in a month or so. And like, it was just, just hearing him. It just taught a lot. It's just, just really good. And, and, and so maybe you're stepping out. You're saying, well, how do I correct this? What's the course correct? Well, listen to what John Mark says. Whatever's in front of you, wherever you're en route to, commit it to God. What does that mean? I think it means you make God your navigator. You pray, God, here's my map. Here's where I'm going. I think the path is from you, but if I'm wrong or need a course correction, stop me, redirect me, turn me around. You lead, I'll follow. That's a great prayer. It's a prayer of open hand. It's a prayer that before you get going, it's like, God, should I be taking this? And he'll, he'll answer that prayer but will you heed it? And then John Mark, he went on to say this. He says, when you chase after God more than any other thing, you'll find that your desires for what you don't have, what you're waiting for, are replaced by the pleasure of what you do have in God. When all of your heart is wrapped up in him, your desires change as he leads and you follow so again, I mean, you know, this Mother's Day, getting a little sappy, just opening up the heart. I mean, I've learned this over and over again that, that man, I just got to trust in him and I can't go ahead of him. And when I do, it's usually not good. And, and so this is a quote from me. How about this one? It's better to wait on God and have things fall into place than to rush ahead of God and have things fall apart. Isn't it true? That's what we want to go for. Next lesson, third lesson on learning to love relentlessly. Good stuff so far? Amen. Third one is this. It's that when I love relentlessly, I forgive frequently. Now, you got to kind of dive into the whole story and get all this. It's there, but let me just draw your attention to what's happening next because we're going to deal with the name change. So the train is off the track. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter 17. And now the backdrop that you need to know is that God often changes people's names to give them a fresh start, to give them a second chance. Hey, you've been given a fresh start and a second chance. And a lot of times in the scriptures, Jesus does it all the time. He'll change your name to show you. 
and the meaning of your name will confirm the direction and the course correct that he has you on. So he changes Sarah or Sarai and Abram's name. He starts with Abram. He says, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. So he's reinstating, he's recommitting the promise, the promise that he gave back in Genesis chapter 12. He's like, it's coming. And so uh, take note, if you're a Bible student, God does this in chapters, monumental Abrahamic covenant, theologians call it. He does it in chapter 12. That's when he gives it the first time. He reinstates it in chapter 17, and he talks it again in chapter nine, uh, 21. So he's constantly talking about, this is where we're headed. So the name change, when he goes from Abraham to Abraham, major upgrade, what does he say? It, it's this idea that multitude of nations, that it literally means that he's going to be the father of many. He's going to be the father of many nations. And then Sarah, let's look at what happens next in chapter 17, verses 15 and 16. And God said to Abraham, so new name, new nation, hey, you're going to be the father. We're going to make this happen, dog. As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. Again, another upgrade. Sarai sounds too much like Siri. Siri. So God's like, you got to change that. And I'll bless her and moreover will give you a son and I will bless her and she shall become nations and kings of people shall come from her. And so a couple things to note in here. Um, one, for the husbands, the first thing I'll just address is um, God said it to Abraham. He could have said it to Sarah. He wasn't trying to, you know, not say it to her. It was, you know, she, she's talking. You know, that's not the case. But I, too, believe that there's a principle here that, what, that oftentimes God encourages us to encourage our spouse that we would be the spiritual leader, that we would be the spiritual encourager. I just thought I'd get a little bit more of a, yeah, you're right, from the guys. But that's what he does. We're not supposed to step back, provide the spiritual leadership, and be the encourager to initiate. Here we see Abraham doing that. Abraham is saying, hey, I'm no longer Abram. I'm Abraham. I'm the father of nations. Look at me. Come on now. Girl, I know. And then she says her name. It literally means princess. Sarai and Sarah both have its roots in the name princess. There's a nuance to, Nera, uh, to Sarah that I'll mention in a moment, but I think that's really important because isn't it true, sentimental thought, that all women are princesses in God's eyes? Isn't it? That they are, man. They're precious and they're beautiful. And, and there is this thing that we have right now in our world and, and, and with social media and all that, it's this mom guilt it's real. I mean, Sarah had mom guilt. She thought she had to be perfect. She thought she had to take care of everything. There's this perfectionism that exists. Hey, do you realize as you're reading all those posts and you're looking at all those pictures that that's, that, that just showing the highlight reel, man, that everybody fails and everybody stumbles. And, and this mom guilt is a real thing. And this search for perfectionism, it, it's a mirage. I mean, God was forgiving Sarah for what she had done. And he says, Sarah is Sarah. And Sarah literally means you're going to be the mother of nations. He's saying to her, just like what it says here, that's what he's saying. He's almost saying, you're the first lady of all that I'm going to do, of all the people that I'm going to bless. She's like the queen. That's who she is. So I've learned in my life that Forgiveness, catch this, is like the oil. It is. It's like the oil in the love of our homes that we need it to keep things running smoothly. Forgiveness is the oil in the engine of love. I mean, we all need to forgive. And so this name change, it signifies a deeper thing that, that man, this is a fresh start and this is a second chance and that's what's happening here. Now, let me speak a little because I've learned a lot about this. And raising three princesses, that's what Jody and I have. I got a queen and three princesses. So let me tell you about some of these little princesses for a moment. They're growing older now so we can look back and say, 
Forgiveness has been the engine, the oil in the engine of love. We've all had to extend it. I remember when one of the princesses, who will remain nameless, she ran away on Easter. In the past, if you're pastor, like, girl, pick any other day. Don't run away on Easter, okay? That's not a good decision. I don't even remember why she ran away. But the other two princesses and the queen, they were surprised when I said, give her a backpack, give her a suitcase, and lock the door. And, and then she left, and it's Easter. Did I remind you of that? <laughs> and, you know, there's all this going on. And then next thing you know, there's a downpour. It's raining for hours. And I got two little princesses and one queen looking at me. Are you going out to search for this girl or what? And, man, I'm, you know, uh, let's just move on to the next story. <laughs> I remember when our other princess, Sophia. You say you don't have, I didn't know you had a daughter named Sophia. Well, I don't. I'm changing the name to protect the guilty. <laughs> what she did, she slammed the bedroom door. And we had a rule in our home, dads take note. I, I don't know. I mean, this is what we did. This is what I was taught. You slam the door, the door comes off the hinges for three days. And so do you guys have that rule? I, we're speaking the same language here. The rest of these people, they don't know how to discipline, I'm telling you. And, and so she slams the door, princess. And so I, next thing I'm up there, with, this is the problem, and you learn this. If you're going to make a threat and you're going to have a consequence, you better follow through. Are you hearing me? And so I'm up there with the hammer, and I'm you know, going like this with the, with the screwdriver. And, and so that door came off for three days. And I'm just going to say, this wasn't the first time for this daughter. And it wasn't the last until she moved out. And, and, then, and then, then, then when Jody slammed the door once, the, the girls are like, Dad, are you going to take that one off? <laughs> Dad, are you gonna, here's the hammer. Here's the screwdriver. Are you gonna take, I'm not that stupid, okay? I, and then I remember, Greg, oh, my goodness. Then, then uh, the, uh, one of the princesses uh, who, gets, who will name, remain nameless to protect the guilty, she... she um, she, she, do you know this thing, like when you get your driver's license, you can't have people when you're 16 in your car other than um, relatives. And, and so it's like, okay. And so, so she's got a car load packed of girls. They're driving, I don't know, Wheaton, Naperville, who knows? They got the Jeep and the top down and they're having a great time. She gets a ticket. And so we're just like, oh my goodness. And I'm like, you know, didn't the other two princesses, oh, now I read her out. It, 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 didn't the other two princesses tell you this? Well, yeah, well, you know, they're my sisters in Christ. I, I mean, and then, and then to make matters worse, this princess, another one who remained nameless, graduation, she graduates. And, you know, you got people coming over. Some of you came over to my house and, and we're all getting ready. And, you know, it's just like everything. And she backs up the car into my car. She, in my driveway. I mean, what is happening? Like, like, didn't you look? I mean, it's a, my car is right behind your car. And she hit it with full force. Hey, Dad, just really sorry. Just graduated, but I'm, you know, and... And then I got a smile, because, you know, and... But isn't it true that forgiveness <laughs> is the oil in the engine of love, and... We all need to practice it. And so I've learned this. Here's my own definition. We'll put it up on the screen. As far as conflict of resolution goes, God forgave me so I could forgive you so that we can forgive all of us. Are you hearing me? That that's what it's about. That that's what it says in Ephesians 4.32, that be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Hey, the reason we got to be so quick to forgive is... Because if you think back to when you were in high school and you were in college, hey, I did some pretty stupid things. And I'm telling you, they were a lot worse than backing into a car and, and slamming a door. I mean, he's forgiven me from so much. And, and how can I withhold that forgiveness to those around us? Hey, man, it's true. Sometimes Sam, family, they know how to push the buttons. Family, they know how to get things going. Family, I mean, they can cause a lot of tension and disaster. But we got to be committed to forgive. 
and to forgive regularly and to forgive faithfully. Talking about relentless love, here's a verse maybe for your family. I know it's a good one for mine. Above all, love each other deeply. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. That's what it does. Next lesson, as we're talking about loving relentlessly, because that's what we want to do. We've got two more. When I love relentlessly, I open up regularly. I've got to open up about my feelings. I, you know, I can't just stuff them down. I've got a tendency to just stuff them down. And, and maybe you're like, and, and you know, when are they going to come out? You, you just, you got to open up your heart and your feelings, not only to God, but for all that are around you. Scripture says, draw near to God and he will do what? He'll, he'll draw near to you. The scripture says the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, that our hearts would be broken and open as, as we verbalize all our feelings to him. Hey, did you know that God's got big shoulders? Why are they so big? Big enough to beat on, big enough to cry on. And so we're going to see Sarah get emotional in a moment. And it ain't necessarily crying, it ain't necessarily tears, because I believe that that's what's been happening. But then it's just like, who can blame her? She's just laughing. And is this a joke, God? I mean, what are you talking about, Lord? And what I didn't tell you was this turn to chapter 18 in our Bibles, it represents another 15 years. So follow the bouncing ball in the message. He gave them the promise, Sarah and Abraham. He gave them 25 years ago. Now, Abraham is pushing the century marker. Sarah is 90, and they still don't have the kid. I mean, who can forgive her, or who can you know, make fun of her for losing it a bit. And that's what she does. So chapter 18, I'll save you and, and get to the, to the good part. But God sends some messengers to Abraham and they're from the Lord and they're going to say, no, this is going to happen, dude. This is going to happen. And, and he's like, okay, I don't know. What am I going to do? I'm like, right, really? And, and Sarah's got the, she's got the, um, the glass on the wall listening to this conversation. Oh boy. Yeah, Right. And that's exactly what we see. Look at verse 12. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, Abram, I mean, I, I'm going to have pleasure? Boy, you could read a lot into that statement. The Lord said to Abraham, why, why did Sarah laugh and, and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord at the appointed time that I will return to you about this time next year? And Sarah, she's going to have a son. And so he's, again, giving the promise. And I don't know about you, but the line that jumps out, do you see it in here? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I mean, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is disaster too hard for the Lord? No, is difficulty too hard for the Lord? Hey, is illness and disease too hard for the Lord? No, it's not. You read the New Testament and death isn't even too hard for the Lord. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. That's why we've got to give him all our feelings, all our emotions, all our doubt. Because he's for us, not against us. And there is nothing that is impossible without him. There is nothing, I repeat, nothing that is too hard for the Lord. Maybe that's the biggest takeaway for you even today is you've been struggling in a situation with some relational conflict, even an illness or whatever it is. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. His timing, his plan. But, but it's been 25 years. Well, as I process that in my own mind and, and we've all waited for things, when God tells you to wait, it's not because he's not at work. God does it to teach, to train, to try, and to transform. That's what's happening in the season of waiting you're in right now. Teach, train, try, and transform. That's what we get from the life of Sarah that that's what he's doing. He's teaching them, he's trying them, he's training them. He, he's transforming them into the people that he wants them to be. And so that's why they got to trust him. That's why they got to just get real and raw with him. I remember when um, 
after we had our uh, two uh, princesses and, and Jody was pregnant with our third. And I mean, the excitement, man. It's just like, you know, yeah, this is like, man, they're coming kind of quick, but let's, you know, this is good. And, and, and um, so she was pregnant and we had a leader meeting all the way up in, uh, I was working for a church at that time. I was going to seminary, working a church in the northwest suburbs of Chicago, and it was all the way in Crystal Lake. And so we had like 50 leaders, a big vision cast. This is what we're doing and what's going on. And, and I could tell, you know, I'm, I'm giving it. And, and then I, I kind of looked over at Jody and I, I, I just, he kind of just knew something was wrong. And I didn't know, I, but I just, you know, you get that sense. And, and so I, I just, you know, we got out of that meeting as quickly as I could. We got in the car. We drove straight to the hospital. And, you know, it wasn't too long after that we found out she was having a miscarriage right then and there. And so that led to a season, which if you've ever gone through that, I, I mean, there's some tears and there's a lot of what, God, and why, God, and, and, and it's a difficult thing. And so we came to terms and, you know, Lord, uh, you know, I guess that's it, man. Two princesses is, is great. And honestly, we we're just like, that's it. That's good. You know, we're, we're, we're excited. We're thankful. And, and one year went by and two years and three years and, and we're, we're, man, this is good. And. And then finally, four years later, Jody's pregnant again. And we're nervous, but, but excited. And so many feelings and so much tension. And Lord, you're doing this. Is, is this happening? And, and then when Emily, our third, was born, Jody, um, she, Jody's responsible for a lot of things in our home. We won't go into all that. She keeps me on track, which is a full-time job. She is responsible for naming, giving the middle names. Because I don't have a middle name, so I'm like, I don't, you know, whatever. Just, you know, whatever. And so I gave that to her, and she's picked out some awesome middle names. But she picked out the name Joy for Emily, because Emily's been a joy. I mean, she's just a joy. She's a joy to our hearts, and she's been a joy as we represent. And look, at she's brought joy to us, because God's been faithful, and God's good. And so... As I think about that, and as I think about what the Lord can do, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. But I also, as I reflect upon my own situation with my own family, and this may relate to some here, but my mom and dad, I mean, my mom couldn't have kids. And, you know, this was a time, a different generation. You know, you didn't really talk too much. I mean, they, you know, my parents, we didn't say we loved you until they were like, we were like in college. You know, it's just a different generation. And so I don't know all that they went through when she couldn't have kids and, and they tried and they tried and they waited and they waited and, and then they decided, you know, they adopted my brother and then they adopted my sister. And, and then I'm telling you, man, they were old. Like they were trying and they, they waited. Like they were as old as Abraham and Sarah. They adopted me. And, and, and God, God did some amazing things and I just, maybe you're in that place where we're just so thankful for those that are adopting kids. Can we give an amen? That those who do this, that they, that they make the sacrifice for others. That's relentless love. And, and so lastly, as our time is escaping, when I love relentlessly, I, I give generously. So I got two more verses. We covered 60 years in 35 minutes. I think that's pretty good. And so... The first one, Genesis 21, this is it. It's, it's the promise. And I'm going to add another verse here, but it says, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord said to Sarah as he had promised. And so you got to read between the lines, but then verse 2 goes on to say, let me read it for you. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time which God had spoken. So, so God fulfilled it. God did it, man. And what's cool about this is despite the fact that Sarah made some mistakes, despite the fact that Sarah didn't always get it right, despite the fact that, you know what, Sarah had a lot of mom guilt, and you do too, God still did it, man. And look at this for a moment. I want to put this up for a second. And this shows it's, a, it's the lineage of Abraham and Sarah to Jesus. And so this is an interesting picture. And because Sarah is, you know, she gave lineage. God did it. He fulfilled it. This, her, their spiritual descendants are as many as the stars in the sky. 
the sand on the seashore. And, and you and I, we're, we're part of that. And, 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 and so this list, it's all not represented because uh, there's Sarah is the great grandmother to the 42nd of Jesus. So say great 42 times. That's what she is. As 42 generations had to pass, and, and then Jesus Christ is part of her lineage, man, from that girl that, that made the mistakes, that stepped out ahead of God, that did some things wrong. I mean, she's remembered for eternity. God used her despite all the things that went wrong, and all the difficulty that ensued. And that's how God is. And I love that picture. So there's, there's more that's represented. If you want a complete list, um, write down Matthew chapter 1. It'll give you all those. If I would have gave it, we'd be going all the way around the room, you know what I mean, to get all the generations. But she's, she's the spiritual lineage to the Savior of the world, this girl Sarah, who we're studying today. And so let me give you the last verse from Hebrews chapter 11. It's in the New Testament. And so for those um, you know, I, I mean, I, I remember, you know, Hebrews 11, what, what's that? It, what's, it's, this, it's this great wall or hall of fame, hall of faith. And so this is like, whoa, these are the, the, these are the big dogs, man. These are, man, God used them. And Sarah's part of that. But notice what God says. Hebrews tells us, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. So did you catch it? Don't miss it. If you didn't hear anything I said for the whole message, hear this right now. Please tune in right now. God used her, yes. But it wasn't because of Sarah's faithfulness to God that he blessed her. It was because of God's faithfulness to her. Are you hearing me? It was about how faithful he was despite the difficulty, despite the pain, despite the failure, as our God is a God of second chances and nothing is too hard for him. No obstacle is too great. No difficulty. I, I mean, it was about God's faithfulness to her, not necessarily her faithfulness to him. And I don't know about you, but when I'm thinking about loving relentlessly with the most special people in my life, man, I got to think about that. Because catch this, our love is relentless because God's love is endless. Let me say that again. Our love can be relentless with those around us because God's love is endless. And that's what it says in Scripture. He loved, we love because he first loved us. That's why we can love. So I'm going to invite the worship team up, and the service isn't over, and this is probably the most important time now. And as you kind of put your things away and get your heart settled, like this is the time. So ushers are actually locking the doors right now so you can't escape. So I'm not joking. Because... It's time not for you to hear from me, but for you to hear from God. And, and so as the worship team is going to get ready, they're going to get set. Don't let that bother you. You're going to have a time to process and learn from him. As I believe he's got a word for you. And, and so as we look at these lessons, I'm just going to ask you, what's the lesson that God is impressing on your heart? And so let me paint some vision for those who may be new. This is kind of called a soft close. And what it means is that that I want, as the worship team begins to sing and Callum sings over us, but like listen for what God wants to say to you. I believe that the Spirit is here. Do you believe me? And the Spirit wants to fill us because we haven't always loved relentlessly. And, and he's, got, he's teaching us some things. He wants to get through to our hearts and, and he wants to show himself strong because our love can be relentless because his love is endless. And for some of us, it's the cup is half empty. For some of us, that it's completely, it, it's fallen over and there's nothing in it. And God wants to fill you so that you can love. And he'll give it to you, man. He will. I promise if you press in with him, he will do it. He, he's the one that can fill us. And so let me end with the quote that I started with. I think this quote has special meaning for our day. The quote that I started with 
from Catherine Ann Porter, the Pulitzer Prize winning author. She says, love must be learned and learned and learned again and again. There is no end to it. But then she says this. She says, hate needs no instruction. It only needs to be provoked. Now, now, do you understand what she's saying? Especially in the world that we're living in, with what we're seeing happening in our country, with the great divide, that, that, that hate just needs to be provoked. That why? Because hate is in us. Why? Because hate is easy. Why? Because hate is the first response. That, that that's the result of the fallen sin nature. That we don't love naturally, we can hate naturally. And so love needs to be learned. So as you bow your heads with me, what is God trying to teach you with heads bowed and eyes closed? What is it that he wants to say to you? And as the worship team sings over us, please allow the Lord to fill you. And when you're ready, if you're able, you stand to your feet and you sing. And your standing is an affirmation that, God, you've filled me. God, you've spoken to me. God, you're working through me. God, you want me. God, you love me. God, I choose you today. God, would you help me to sacrifice willingly, Lord? Make the sacrifice that you want, Lord. Reveal right now in this moment. I just pray you'd reveal some sacrifices that you desire your children to make for the good of each other. Maybe it's, maybe it's a decision that, that needs to be made, a, a move that you need to make. Lord, help us to trust implicitly. For some, his trust is broken down and relationships that are closest to us are often the most difficult. Help us, Lord, what, what do I need to do? Ask the Lord, what do I need to do to take a step of faith to, to rebuild trust? And Lord, is there someone that I need to forgive? Because you've extended it to me. And Lord, I pray that we would open up to you and we would give of ourselves generously to you because I believe in you. And I trust you.